Um, hi, um, my name is Cara, uh, Cara Jones, just forgot my name, um, and I work for an organisation called Archaeology Scotland. Um, we're based um, just outside of Edinburgh, but we work throughout Scotland, um, we work from like Shetland down to Dumfries and Galloway. Um, we have, um, we support a lot of sort of local art, um, archaeological initiatives, but we do really have a sort of quite a wide ranging role um, in Scottish archaeology, but I've written it rather than talk at you about it. Um, and more information is on our website as well about what we do. Um, we generally have um, three key aims which again I've listed up there, and we try to deliver those through our two flagship, uh, flagship schemes, um, which is Scottish Archaeology Month, which is a month-long festival taking place in September, and Adopt a Monument, which is what I work on. Um, so with Adopt a Monument, um, we encourage and facilitate the needs of communities who want to take a leading role uh, in conserving and promoting their local heritage. Um, we relaunched in August 2011. Um, we already have 60 groups on our waiting list. We're meant to only complete 40 Adopter Monument projects over the next five years, and we're also meant to complete 15 outreach projects. So already in our first sort of six to eight months, we've got a huge over demand. Um, we, one of the sort of main things we do is really sort of provide advice and training, training opportunities on these sort of six topics here. Um, but the most probably important aspect of our scheme is that it's a bottom-up bottom up approach. All the ideas and decisions come from the groups. We give guidance, um, we give them all the guidance that they need to be able to do their projects, but we let them make the decisions. We don't go in and tell them what they should be doing. Um, the new scheme is set up to continue helping the more traditional community groups, um, and it will focus on increasing skills, understanding, capacity and confidence. But additionally, we're aiming to take heritage to non-traditional audiences um, through a series of outreach projects. Um, and our target audiences with those projects are homeless, ethnic communities, women, lower um, socio social economic groups, immigrant groups, and the elderly. Um, because we really firmly believe that heritage should be open to all. Um, and the new phase of Adopt a Monument is really allowing us to rethink about the end products that each group will produce. To make sure that this phase of Adopt a Monument is open to all, we've been looking at easy ways to get different audiences involved by focusing what products um, our groups are producing and how they're creating it. Um, previously, our groups have produced um, interpretation through traditional mediums. They produced um, information leaflets, interpretation <coughs> boards and panels, and they've disseminated results through grey literature. As you can see from these pictures, um, maybe we should have made them a bit bigger, um, some of the issues which arise from this is that mediums very quickly become weathered and out of date. They're unattractive and they're really costly to place. And grey literature also has a really bad habit of staying hidden unless you know where to look for it. So, as I've said, this new phase of the project sort of brings the opportunity to utilise advances in new media to mitigate <laughs> against some of these issues. Um, so, I mean, as I've said, we only really started in um, last August and we're still in the early phases of our five-year project. Um, but what we started to do is sort of turn the early results of our projects into mobile phone applications. Um, we've been using um, a company called Make a Mapper, which is just down there. This is a free um, online software that you can upload your map for free. At the moment, it does cost the user to download it, but we're in the sort of early stages of thinking about how we could create our own sort of um, online software that groups will, so the user will be able to download for free, but that's sort of still in the early stages. Um, but it's really quick and easy to use. It's available on iPhone and Android, and participants can work together to create the content of the app, um, and in some cases, if they feel confident enough, they can upload and create the product themselves. Um, and community groups can um, advertise these products on their websites. Um, as you can see, just in the corner here, our Breaker group, um, they already <coughs> have an early app um, advertised on their website, um, which is just basically they've uploaded an audience survey map of first edition of their village, and it allows anyone visiting the village to sort of see what it used to look like. Um, 
we recognise that the sort of technical aspects of producing these products can be a barrier to some participants. So we're providing training opportunities in creating and uploading mobile phone apps so that the community group which is completing the work, so it's the community group that's completing the work rather than an IT specialist sort of doing it remotely, never seen, never, never talked to. Um, and we're also advocating the use of free software such as Microsoft uh, Photosim, which um, is down there, and that allows you um, a complete 360 degree view of an object or a monument. Um, we're running a workshop this weekend on Mole, um, teaching participants how to use Photosynths um, and other digital recording software. I'm not sure what the other software is yet because I'm not running the workshop. Um, but again, it's allowing, we're teaching the groups to be able to independently produce their own products that they can put on their websites. <coughs> um, and we also feel by sort of producing these sorts of um, applications that we are able to try and engage with a new kind of audience. And we can also, I think, start developing, we can start to develop new skills amongst more the tra sort of traditional community groups um, who have previously felt excluded from this digital technology. Um, and one of our early sites that we're working on um, here is at Molkayuk. Um, this site is in partnership with the North of Scotland Archaeology Society, or NOSAS, who are a fab group and they're, they're really excellent at sort of getting up into remote places and recording archaeological landscapes. Um, they've recorded this township um, before Adopt a Monument had got involved through the Royal Commission's SRP programme. Um, but they wanted to um, work further on this site and so they wanted to conserve it, um, conserve the remains by erecting a livestock fence and promote the site to the wider public. Um, this group is firmly against um, traditional panels on site because they feel the visitor should be able to engage and interpret the site as little or as much as they want. Um, so we were looking at them um, to sort of make possible <coughs> cash QR codes at discrete but obvious places like gateposts um, so that people, um, so it's a kind of unintrusive way of offering interpretation to visitors. Um, as Dan pointed out, again, it's the user that has to pay for that and that is something hopefully we will overcome over the next five years. Some of our groups do want these sort of traditional interpretation boards and we fully support that, but it's still perhaps, um, these traditional methods can perhaps be supplemented um, with digital products, um, which can be very cheap, um, cheap to produce, and much more than so than interpretation panels. I'm astonished how much interpretation <laughs> panels cost, by the way. Um, as I say, we've already encountered some sort of barriers to our grand plans. Um, 3G reception in Scotland is very limited and it's mainly centred along, along the sort of big population areas. In 2010, 44% of Scotland did not have 3G access and of the 66% that did have 3G um, access, um, many of them it was only for, with one provider, so you have to make sure you've got the right mobile phone contract. Again, these areas are centred around sort of um, central population areas and a lot of our sites are in rural locations. Um, the Scottish Government has a general infrastructure plan in place for digital participation and hopefully by, as our project develops, um, their plans will be implemented and help improve this issue. Um, but these are really sort of key barriers for digital participation. Um, but I think they, are, they can be overcome. You can still download your app um, before you go there. You can use your GPS um, locator rather than phone signal. And providing your information is embedded within your app, you can still access that information. But then with that, we need to make sure that we're promoting this information um, in relevant places. We and the groups need to develop working partnerships with regional tourism organisations to promote the digital interpretation in the right place, to make sure everyone knows it's there to be used. sort of encountered digital barriers with our outreach projects, albeit a very different kind. Um, we've already completed one project called Digging the Sea, um, and that was working with a drop-in centre in central Edinburgh, working with socially excluded participants, many of whom have never had the chance to take part in archaeology or local history projects. So many of these participants um, had lovely, um, sorry, lovely, they are all lovely, and they are really nice, <laughs> um, but they have low literacy skills. 
and little experience with the computer or technology. So they actually really enjoy sort of getting in and doing sort of photographic surveys and uploading those photographs onto computer and then putting them on Facebook. Um, and they really enjoyed using a computer to research the history of the area. And they, they used sort of digital technology to write newsletters so that other people knew what they were up to. And we're hoping as well, um, eventually, to put all the results from this project, again, into a mobile phone app. Um, while working with this group, though, we, we became really heavily reliant on online digital resources. Um, we had limited time working um, each week with this group. Um, and beyond the introductory tours, the groups were unable to direct, um, directly visit a lot of the archive centres, um, as mainly um, as a lot of them sort of live quite chaotic lifestyles, and archive centres often need bookings, and you need to sort of plan in advance that you're going to go and visit them. So because of that, we started promoting the internet to do, to do their sort of local history research. We're really lucky in Scotland that we've got so much of our historic environment data online. Um, and it's, it's all there, really, for us to, to, to access. Um, but with that came our sort of next barrier, which was most of the project participants didn't have access to computers. Um, and some of our participants had never used the computer before and needed training and encouragement to complete the research. Um, I looked at hiring computer suites, and again, astronomically expensive to hire one for two hours every week. Um, so the way we addressed this barrier was by helping participants to get library cards so they could access the computers and the internet um, at the Edinburgh Central Library, which is actually just around the corner from the drop-in centre. Um, and it meant they could also go and do research in their spare time in a nice, safe and dry place where there were helpful people that could help them with their research. Um, I think this, this approach kind of had, it had limited um, success with this group. Of the eight people that regularly attended, only four signed up for a library card. But it did mean that four could then go to the rest of the group and tell them, oh, guess what I did in the library the other day? Things like that. Um, so I think it's definitely an idea that we'll be promoting with our future outreach projects, the use of libraries and council service points for getting on the internet and accessing those digital resources. Um, also, while working with this group, we lent out laptops during the session so participants could practice on, practice on them. Um, and in addition to this, we're hoping to work with this group again, but we're seeking extra funding specifically for tablets, um, more laptops and smartphones. So we'll be able to sort of lend them out um, without sort of getting risk of the one archaeologist on the laptop getting broken. Um, and we, we found as well um, that by really promoting the sort of digital technology aspect of this local history project, um, that it was a great hook to get people involved. Um, because I think perhaps some people, especially when working with this sort of different non-traditional heritage audience, they're more interested in getting involved with computers or photography rather than sort of going in and doing an archaeology projects. So it's a really great way to sort of develop key transferable skills. Um, I think I've actually whizzed through my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've, I've listed here um, a lot of the benefits of sort of engaging with new media. Um, obviously, I feel we're in such a unique position that I've listed it twice, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but, I, I mean, I am a firm believer that sort of engaging with new media and, and online digital resources is, is a really great way to supplement your community projects. Um, but I would say that we've identified four key barriers to utilising digital resources and, and these are really like access to computers and smartphones and tablets. It's connectivity, because in Scotland it's crap. Um, <laughs> and also, um, it's the, you know, the participants have to have the required skill and knowledge to create and use these digital resources and sometimes at first that can be quite daunting and, unless we're there to sort of help them guide them through the process. Um, and perhaps the future barrier is it's unproven how sustainable all of this really is. Um, will the results from our project be disseminated through digital resources, be still available in 10 years' time? We're hoping by training the participants, they'll be able to continue producing these sorts of products, you know, after Adopt a Monument. Um, but, I mean, I don't want to end on a negative note, but I think it's um, really important as practitioners that we consider the negatives of um, using these new medias and then try to develop methodologies for overcoming them. 
So that's it. I think I've really missed through that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>